So thanks everyone for attending Data Engineering and the Death of Visual ETL. Just a, a couple of things I'm broadcasting from my house as probably everyone's watching from their house. And uh, I got a house full of kids and I got a rabid dog that hates the UPS man. So we, who knows if, uh, if I get a package while this is going on, you might hear some barking. My apologies for that. But with that, let's get started. So this is me. So if you're interested in following me in any of these social media platforms, I'd be, I'd be honored if you would. Uh, so you can see me there on Twitter, Medium. I don't post as much as I should. Um, I promise to start doing that again one day. Uh, my marketing team would love that. And then also there on LinkedIn if you're interested in following me there as well. Just a few things about Red Pill before we jump into the, to the content, to the proper content. Um, if you're interested in anything you're about to hear, uh, please reach out to me on one of those uh, channels or uh, feedback here at the webinar uh, or just uh, the Red Pill Twitter uh, handle. Um, so, you know, we, the primary way that we engage with our customers is through a service we call Elastic Delivery. And that's where we build um, a virtual team for you. We've been delivering projects virtually for years. Our project delivery really hasn't changed much in the last few weeks. So, you know, this is the way we've been, do been doing it for quite some time. Elastic delivery is a way for us to structure a team that fits your use case or your needs for, for analytics delivery. We really have two kind of styles. One is one we call crew. And Elastic crew is where you, we, we construct a team and that team kind of operates autonomously. You give us, uh, you give that team requirements, that team uh, solves those requirements. They may be from analysis, data engineering, um, analytics and dashboard delivery, the entire sort of soup to nuts uh, delivery of, of what it means to, to, to get, give organizations um, analytics and, and enable them to be data driven. And so, that team can operate as your sole analytics team. That team can operate alongside your analytics team and just focus on different areas or different pieces of content. The other way that we do it is when we call Elastic Surge. And that's where we add a number of members to your project team. So we are more directly interfacing with your data engineers or your analytics um, folks, your analysts. Uh, and more of a coherent team. So either solution, um, we, we use both quite, quite frequently. If either of those sound interesting to you, then please reach out. I'd love to, I'd love an opportunity to, to chat with you about it. And then these are the technologies we typically use. So uh, it, we, we work with a lot of different data warehouse solutions, uh, mostly cloud-based. We work with a lot of different analytics tools, also usually cloud-based, but also on-prem uh, on occasion. And then the, the data engineering, which we're gonna be talking about a lot today, we do a lot of different solutions there. And there's just really a, a sort of a triage process we walk through with our customers to figure out what's the best solution for them. We don't have any one single data integration solution that we, that we really use. We just use a bunch of them. And you'll see uh, a couple of choices I made today for the demo uh, and and it's a good one. You'll see a lot of Databricks today. But in general, there's a lot of solutions here that we can use. So with that, let's jump in. So this is a very popular Medium post done by Maxime Boschman. Beauchem I always have trouble with that word. Where he sort of fired a shot across the bow um, with sort of traditional ETL and the direction that that tends to be going now in the world of data engineering. And, you know, it's a great article. Uh, there's, the, there's the link. Um, maybe I'll have Lauren uh, tweet that, that link out after this uh, presentation's done so you can uh, more easily find it. But if you're interested, I really recommend, because uh, Maxime, um, unlike a lot of data, data engineers practicing today, he, he comes from the world of traditional ETL. So he's done that. And now he's moved forward and he does more uh, what we consider modern data engineering. And this post is really about what's different. And there's one real key highlight that I pull out of it that I think is, is perhaps uh, you, you know, the most telling aspect. 
And that is that you know, there have come, there have been paradigms and other development, um, uh, you know, other sorts of software development where graphical tools have come and gone. And really, in most cases, gone. Um, but we still have that heritage here in, in the ETL space, and we'll talk about that a bit. But in general, regardless of what you're developing, what you're delivering, code is the best abstraction. It's simply, you know, there's no better way to get your meaning across in, in a process than with code. And with code comes a lot of other things that traditional ETL tools uh, tend not to do very well. And that's configuration as code, source control, automated deployments, regression testing, and all the things that, that perhaps ETL developers have taken for granted that have lived in the, in the areas of software development for years. And so not only is code the best abstraction, and you know, obviously we'll, we'll argue that point today, and, for, and I'll try to make that point, but um, taking that for uh, whether you buy into that yet or not, there is a lot that comes with code that you just simply have a tough time doing with traditional ETL tools. And we'll talk about that as well. So, you know, there was a time when, um, and I'm, you know, you can see the gray hair here, where this was all the rage, these visual development tools. And I can tell you that almost without exception, they are not used today. They're not used in areas of um, uh, pure application development, um, user interface. Nowhere are these tools really used anymore. And that's because of that value of abstraction that code gives us. So what I'm going to do today is, is, is try to dive into sort of the traditional ETL world and, and, and sort of ask ourselves why we think graphical development is so still so common there at least in traditional ETL. And we'll kind of take a peek into the, the more modern data engineering space where graphical tools are almost never used and try to figure out what, you know, what's going on there. Why is there a movement, at least for some more modern implementations to this more data engineering direction? So what, what is so different about ETL? I mean, I have some theories and I'm, I'm going to lay some of them out, but we have to kind of ask ourselves as, as uh, graphical design paradigms have eroded in almost every other space, we still see so much, you know, um, involvement of, of graphical uh, development in the ETL space, or at least in the traditional ETL space. So as we look at sort of code versus clicks, I'm going to try not to build a straw man argument here, but I'm, I'm going to try to tell you what I think is some of the reasons why, um, you know, code shines and some of the reasons why clicks still sort of have their place, or at least in, in, in some people's minds. So with code, I alluded to a little bit of this already. We have things like source control. Configuration is code. That means that you can build whole environments and applications with a series of Git repos with automated um, build up, build down processes. And we can have our entire environment. We can build an environment with a push of a button. And that can be a dev environment, a QA environment, or even a production environment with literally a few clicks or some sort of API call. And that's really difficult with legacy BI tools. Um, and really any sort of graphical development uh, paradigm. We also see CICD. So that is continuous integration, continuous deployment. And these sorts of tools really expect code in most cases. There's ways around that. We've built a product called Checkmate that tries to do all of this for Oracle Business Intelligence or Oracle Analytics, I should say. But in general, that's, that's a lot of hard work and heavy lifting. When your process lives in code natively, that's a really easy step to take. And when you start looking at things like containerization and all the more modern ways of delivering applications today, code is, is, is almost uh, just so, sort of table stakes for that. Collaboration, what I'm thinking about here is the process of opening pull requests using things like Git ops. Uh, the, the, the sort of the, the way that uh, once your code sits in source control, 
there's no stepping outside of the frameworks around that source control to do things like comment on uh, development uh, pull requests and collaborate around code, collaborating around uh, user interfaces or client fit client servers is really very, very difficult. And then also finally, uh, code anywhere. So this is the idea that, you know, I'm on my laptop, I'm on a plane perhaps, or I'm sitting in a coffee shop, and I don't want to have to connect a, a graphical display of some kind to a server, right? So I, I think about a lot of the traditional ETL tools, they all fall into this uh, problem, which is they, they have a thick client, that client has to connect to a server, to a database, to whatever. The experience of developing with that lag is very problematic. Um, we struggle with this with these traditional ETL tools. What is the best way to, to, to actually stand up these environments such that that lag is not something that decreases productivity? And we've seen it time and time again. So the idea that we can just code anywhere, open up, open a development, uh, you know, code editor and write processes. Now we probably still need to be able to execute those and maybe we need connectivity to services to do that but the actual experience of development does not have the lag associated with client server implementations. Now what's good about clicks? At least I'm going to debate most of these, uh, but anyway, this is what I feel like at least uh, in having conversations with, with organizations that you know, still rely on clicks as a way to build data pipelines or, or mappings or whatever you want to call it. But in general, this is what I hear. It's faster. Again, I'm going to debate that. Easier to start is it? You know, it's easier for someone without a software development background to get started. And I think that's all of those last three items kind of fall into that same general category. In that, you know, it's easier for someone who didn't get a computer science degree to to develop. Um, that person can come from any discipline or even from the business. And so, uh, you, you know, you'll see me as I walk through this sort of debate these things. But I do believe that this is sort of where, um, um, where the still reliance on graphical tools, this is the belief for why that, that still occurs. So that maybe this is the assumption. Uh, I don't believe this, but I think this is the, at least an assumption I see a lot of shops say, and that is that code is better. We, we, we might buy that, Stuart, uh, CI, CD, code anywhere, collaboration, we get all that, it's just too hard. And so this is the point I think I'm really gonna take issue with it for the rest of this presentation and at least try to convince you that that is um, an incorrect assumption. So it's interesting in the data warehouse space and I'm talking about traditional data warehousing here. This is sort of what's uh, the evolution, I would argue, of where we got to where we are with traditional ETL tools. We, we probably started with SQL when we were loading data warehouses back in the day. And we probably had some sort of glue around that. Maybe they were bash scripts, shell scripts, Perl scripts. Uh, and now more today, even probably you see still this paradigm with Python scripts or whatever. Um, then we moved to, to sort of GUI ETL tools. And then one step further was GUI ELT tools. Or if you looked at something like Oracle Data Integrator, it could do ETL or ELT, just depending on how you uh, built your, your framework and your mappings. And so for some reason, um, traditional ETL tools feel the need to abstract SQL away. Uh, for some reason, we felt like SQL itself was, I don't know, too hard to, um, I, don't, I don't know, not a great way to build uh, mappings. And so when you look at where uh, the modern data platforms, they sort of went through, you know, if you, if you talk about building off of what, um, you, you know, that final step of that ELT, and then we went to distributed data platforms. I'm talking about MapReduce here, Spark, and all these sort of languages that allowed us to do distributed data movement. But then that final step that they felt that these distributed platforms needed is they wanted to embrace SQL again. It's the one thing we didn't have in the big data space. 
And so everybody rushed to add it. There's a whole lot of different ways to do basically SQL on Hadoop, uh, but, but let's not say Hadoop, let's say distributed data platforms. Obviously they began with Hadoop, but now they're, they're being used in object stores and cloud implementations and all sorts of frameworks like Kafka and Apache Beam and all the different ways that you can move data, they've all adopted SQL. So it's interesting to me that what's happening in the modern world, uh, no offense to legacy ETL tools, but what's happening in this sort of this side of the house is a complete and total embrace of SQL again. Maybe that's because uh, you never know what you had until it's gone. Um, we needed it, we wanted it. Um, it's the universal language for, for speaking data. And so these distributed platforms wanted SQL and they all added it. For some reason though, in, a, in the legacy ETL space, we feel like SQL was, a, was, a, um, was not a workable solution. So I'm not really giving you a, 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 a solution as more of an observation here that SQL for at least a lot of what's going on in, in modern data platforms today is all the rage again. And so, the challenge I sort of throw to the traditional ETL space is, is why did we think that SQL wasn't the, why did we need SQL generation tools to just sort of boil it down? We felt we needed SQL generation tools where modern platforms said, we don't need that. Just give me SQL. SQL is what I need. So that's sort of a backdrop for where I'm going for the rest of this talk is sort of an embrace of code, but also you're going to see an embrace of SQL. SQL uh, on its own. So let me ask you, when you're doing a traditional, uh, obviously I can't get feedback like I do uh, in a live audience, but I'll ask the question. Um, I'll pretend uh, to consider the answers and then just kind of, kind of give it to you. But in general, this is Oracle Data Integrator. Um, this is what it looks like to build graphical, um, you know, graphical mappings. And so the question I always ask when I'm doing this live is, if you're a ETL developer, is this the only screen you have open while you're developing? I always get, no, Stuart, we also have this. Now, why do we have this? We have, this is, by the way, this is just a Snowflake browser where I can write SQL and see results, right? Right there in the browser. But this may be, you're on-prem, this may be SQL developer, Toad, uh, if this were uh, a bunch of years ago, but you have something where you're executing and issuing SQL. So why is that, right? If SQL and code are so hard, why is it that at least every developer I've ever seen with graphical tools has both of these windows open? And the real work that that person is doing is in that SQL window. They're discovering joins. They're testing theories. They are, um, you know, uh, testing granularity and seeing how result sets come back. Now, is that because perhaps our e traditional ETL tools didn't give us a good experience there? I would say yes. If you look at some newer tools like stream sets, for example, uh, this is not a stream sets, stream sets presentation, but stream sets gives us, you know, every step along the way, the result set we can see, we can sample the data at every piece. So perhaps it's just a problem with these traditional ETL tools. But I can tell you that almost without exception, um, thinking about Informatica or data integrator, uh, whatever it is that I, IBM has that used to be called essential data stage, I think those tools just didn't do this well. And therefore, the really hard work we were doing was in the SQL editor. And then what's happening is we're reverse engineering our code into a graphical design paradigm. So I ask you, if SQL's too hard or code's too hard, then why do we start there? If I just have to go try to represent my code with clicks after the fact, is it really, are clicks really faster? easier, any discipline? I would argue no, because we find ourselves in these SQL windows anyway. And that's because SQL is the great equalizer. Now I'll take it another step, which is to pick on Informatica for a minute. So do you know what this is? This is an Informatica um, editor where I can build mappings. 
And this is what's called SQL override. And instead of, in Informatica, instead of me having to go and reverse engineer the clicks, at least for the source lookup, I can actually just paste my SQL in and skip that step. And I can tell you, 90% of the ETL mappings I see built in Informatica use SQL override. So basically what you have here when you're using Informatica and SQL override is a million dollar SQL script. There's a lot better ways, and I can tell you much cheaper ways to write a SQL script. I don't need this difficult graphical user interface as a way to try to um, encapsulate my SQL. Just write SQL, and we'll get to how you can do that in a minute, but you know, stop, do, stop doing this. And it's not that SQL overrides the problem. I'm not telling you to stop doing that. I'm telling you to, to just consider writing code and executing code by itself. Uh, you, you know, it seems so um, easy to write SQL when you're using the right framework, the right um, uh, whatever, uh, with source code, with source control, um, collaboration, code anywhere type strategies. This is uh, from a blog post that I did, and there's the, the link down there, oh, over 10 years ago now. So follow me, it's very dated, but I think it makes a really good point. This is when I worked for, for Written and Need. Um, great blog out there. Uh, this is still out there. Uh, so if you wanna take a look, it's, it's there. So I was using, this will, this will really go way back. I was using Oracle Warehouse Builder, a tool that, um, that is now on the scrap heap of history that uh, I couldn't get the tool to do something. And that was a, I don't know if you can see my, my pointer, hopefully you can, but this is a partition by right outer join. So this is a way for you, when you're doing an outer join, instead of just outer, outer joining two data sets, you wanna outer join the data set to a partitioned view of the table. So outer join it every time to a particular, uh, in this case, promo ID. So it's a way to sort of fill in the gaps um, of, a, of, a, of a table to do things like basket analysis. In this case, I was filling in days of the week. So my fact table didn't have every day represented for every promo ID and I wanted to layer it in and fill in the gaps. I couldn't get Warehouse Builder to do that. So what did I do? I created a view. Now, nothing wrong with that, but then we go to using the tool and the resolution is awful um, because 10 years ago, this resolution was probably amazing. But now inside, this is just a source, a filter, uh, an aggregator, and then a load to the final target. But here's the problem with that whole clicks are easier mentality. If we can't get the tool to do what we want, then we break that whole graphical UI experience and have to find ways to get the tool to do it. Now, the worst thing about this solution that I implemented is that when you look at this mapping for those business friendly uh, or in start and, and any discipline style developers, they don't know that this isn't a simple mapping. This runs a long time because that partition by outer join is very in, uh, intensive. So by looking at this mapping, you're like, I don't understand why this simple mapping takes so long to load. So, uh, you know, I, I, I implemented this. This is my fault. And then finally, uh, this is also from Ritmamid, um, and it's going to look like I'm picking on them. I'm not, but the, uh, there's, there's a reason they built this. I 100% believe that, it was, it was, that there's a good reason they built this. But this is a framework that, and you speak to them about, I don't, I don't know a whole lot about it, but this is a framework that they wrote that allowed them to generate with code Oracle data integrator mappings. And I know why they probably did it, is they had a customer that wanted to build a whole bunch of, you know, one-for-one -one mappings and have those execute in Oracle data integrator, and it didn't make any sense for someone to, to write all those. So they wrote a framework that allowed them to generate it. Very smart. So if we think about this paradigm, we're going to use code to generate a mapping to then generate code. So this, this sort of paradigm 
that these enterprise tools force us into, these legacy ETL tools force us when we want to do things like source control and configuration and automation and all those things, we pigeonhole ourselves into trying to make it work with a framework that was never meant to do that. What we actually do in this scenario is code GUI code. And I don't know about you, uh, you saw that screen where they configured with, I think it's Groovy, Groovy DSL, how to build a mapping, but I would just rather write this. I mean, when I look at what's in source control, I understand that. And more to the point, anyone, I would argue, understands. If you don't know SQL, it's debatable whether or not you should be building ETL mappings and data pipelines. And that's just a, perhaps a bold statement. But if you don't know SQL, perhaps you shouldn't be the one writing pipelines. Um, I don't know how you troubleshoot it if it fails. I don't know how you uh, work through it. So the idea that people can't use SQL, I think maybe you have the wrong people working on things. And just to make sure that I'm not picking on uh, Ritman Mead, uh, StreamSets does the same thing, and we love StreamSets. We're a StreamSets partner. But StreamSets also provides an SDK. It's a graphical design tool. They provide an SDK for you to be able to generate these visual mappings. And so, again, I think I would rather just write the code that StreamSets is generating here as opposed to using their SDK to write their their pipelines that then translate into Spark or whatever uh, stream sets is generating. So let's get down to sort of brass tacks now. Um, what, what is it that, you know, what is the real fear of adopting code, getting away from clicks and going to code? I think it's this idea that you're just basically starting from scratch, right? If you don't have, if you're not using a visual ETL tool, then somebody has to, with a blank canvas, sit down and start writing an ETL framework, logging, um, auditing, and all those things. And that's just not the case. We have so many options now for adopting frameworks that although they are code-based, the amount of code you have to write is tiny. It's one pager. It is a little bit of, uh, of code. And then I'm, uh, the, the demonstration I'm gonna do is just using SQL. Uh, I'm gonna show you one solution in Databricks where the majority of what we're writing is the same kind of SQL we're all used to using. So we aren't starting with a blank palette or a blank slate. And I've got a couple of frameworks here. Uh, and for time purposes, I'm not gonna go into any of these in detail. I'm just gonna tell you what they are. So we have Kafka Connect. So if you're, um, if you're, sort of organization is heavily invested in Kafka. It's, a, it's an ingestion and delivery framework and it's a great solution for that. If you have that, then you probably would wanna look at writing something in Kafka Streams. Kafka Connect um, builds the connectors in and out of Kafka. And then Streams is the Java-based library for which you can write very easy one-page um, data pipelines. And then this, this slide's a little dated, but they've rolled out KSQL which is great. Okay, um, I, I did a guest blog post on their blog about some case SQL that we did on a project. Um, so it's great. So again, um, everybody that doesn't have SQL in these modern platforms is, is certainly uh, producing SQL based uh, pipeline generation. And then we also have Spark Streaming. So you're going to see me write some Spark processes. Spark Streaming is an is a enhancement on top of basic Spark so that you can use Spark for your batch and your streaming. Uh, we have data flow down there. So that's Google's uh, cloud-based uh, data pipeline tool. And underneath that is an open source language called Apache Beam, which is a write once, execute, um, multiple executors style solution. Um, if you're interested in that, so you write it in Apache Beam and execute it locally or in the Google Cloud. And then Flink. So these are just, there's, there's so many though, by the way, there's so many but this is just a, a small collection of some of the things you might consider. And really, uh, there are so many frameworks and all of them are quite easy. And all, um, I'm, I'm not a huge user of Flink, never really done anything there. But the other three I know for a fact all have SQL uh, at, um, language on top of it. So you can use SQL to generate 
processes in these frameworks. So write small bits of Java if you want, write small bits of SQL, whatever, you can, ex you, you can execute it in this framework. So one final thing before we get into sort of the solution I'm gonna show you, which is a Spark-based solution in Databricks. And I often get this, so I wanna sort of head it off at the pass. You're gonna see me do a whole lot of um, ETL or data engineering processes in the demonstration and load a data warehouse, which in this case is uh, Snowflake. And I often get the, the question of, well, why don't you just write the SQL in Snowflake? Snowflake's a SQL database. And that is a very valid option, by the way. I don't wanna discount that option. But what I'm thinking about is a more, um, you know, full architecture for an organization, top to bottom. And that organization may have um, other data sources they need to deliver to than just uh, a corporate data warehouse. Now, Snowflake can facilitate a lot of those use cases as well. But what I wanted to build was an abstracted data lake style solution that can feed a bunch of downstream processes, one of which is Snowflake. But I will say, if what you're primarily delivering is a data warehouse, then you perhaps can just write the SQL. And there's a lot of ways to do that. Snowflake has, and we, you know, one of, one of the ways is DBT. So we're a DBT partner. We love this tool. If what you really want to do is just write SQL and execute it in Snowflake, you can absolutely do that. Uh, DBT can also execute in Delta Lake, which, which is Spark based. It can execute in a lot of places, BigQuery and other things. So it, it's not just a Snowflake SQL delivery tool, but that's one of the things it can deliver. So if you are in the use case where you're primarily building a data warehouse and everything else is sort of ancillary and you're not concerned with it, then by all, by all means, get started quickly, move uh, in an agile fashion, use DBT, build your, your pipelines right there in, in your data warehouse and, and just do it there. And it also has great lineage capabilities. It's a really good tool. I will, I believe next week, uh, be talking more about DBT on our free webinar next week. So if that is something you're interested in, then, then jump in for that. So the, the main sort of question you need to ask yourself in trying to figure out whether I, I build a, a, a data processing layer outside my data warehouse or inside my data warehouse, it's really just, it's really one main question. Do you need, does this data transformation need to feed other systems other than just the data warehouse? If so, you probably don't want to do it there. Um, there's gray area, but you, but you know, data warehouses typically aren't great at feeding other systems. So that's just something to keep in mind. It's usually a terminal, um, a, a terminal location for your data. So other use cases we might want to consider uh, other than just your sort of your traditional uh, dashboards and, and delivery of analytics that uh, traditionally happens in a data warehouse is, you know, event streaming. Are you streaming events to a lot of downstream systems? Are you, you know, trying to deliver things to mobile analytics? So, it, you know, if, if mobile's your game, analytics inside of a device, maybe querying a data warehouse is not the best for that. Maybe you have some other data stores you want to load to make that mobile analytics experience a little, a little better. Search, you know, I don't, I don't, how do you search your data warehouse for the color red? Um, that's a difficult sort of um, thing to pose in SQL. So there might be some other side by side systems to your, to your data warehouse that you want to use for, for being able to search all your data. And there's a lot of solutions for that. So that's another use case you might, you might want to feed from this data engineering process. And then machine learning. When we, you know, a data warehouse is not a great place to, to be doing machine learning algorithms, right? Because in a lot of cases, you've scrubbed out the interesting data that from which we can sort of um, use to, to, to uh, cluster things and guess things, uh, to predict things. And, you know, you've already, in most cases in a data warehouse, I transformed it and, and, and imbued it with your opinion. And machine learnings are really about not trying to, to um, um, you know, use your opinionated data as a source. So, so those are, there's usually, you know, untransformed 
raw data is really more interesting for, for machine learning use cases, and therefore perhaps a data warehouse isn't great for that. I will say in Snowflake's defense, they do most of this pretty well too, but in general, these are some things to consider. So today I'm gonna show you Spark. I'm gonna use Databricks and I'm gonna show you Spark and really only a little bit of Spark because I'm gonna do most of it in Spark SQL. So why Spark? Really in today's world, it's more a question of why not Spark? Um, there's, you know, I, I mentioned Kafka streams earlier. If you're heavily invested in, in Kafka, then don't roll out another uh, cluster to do your data processing. Just do your data processing inside of Kafka. Use the Kafka cluster and offset management and all the great magic sauce that has. Uh, but if you're looking at more sort of a totalitarian view of how you might, how, how Kafka might be a part of your overall framework, you, you might look at, at writing Spark even when you have Kafka. And Spark is just great, uh, as you'll see. And Databricks makes it really simple. And so why Databricks? Because Databricks makes Spark SQL. They're the, 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 I guess you'd say the sponsor behind the open source Spark. They do a lot of the commits. Uh, the founders of Spark are, are there at Databricks. And also they're just, they've got a great product, their cloud service and no, uh, cloud-based notebooks. Um, it, it's just really, uh, there's very few that, that can compare. And I do wanna just talk for a minute about Delta Lake which is not a requirement for you coding things, um, data movement with SQL, but it sure does make it really, really simple. So I don't have time to really dive into this in a big way, but Delta is a format on top of raw data storage that gives you things like acid transactions, time travel, right? So flashing back and forward um, and, and, and really just maintaining um, a, a a, it, it kind of gives relational like capabilities around um, what's traditionally just raw data in an object store. So it's really great, uh, lots of great features. And what you're gonna see me do in the demo is, 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 de is Delta specific, but it's just, I had to choose something. I chose Databricks, Delta Lake, um, Snowflake as a target. These things are, are, these are great solutions, but there's a whole lot of different ways to, to peel the onion. And, um, you know, Databricks just makes it easy to do all those things I described earlier. CI, CD, configuration as code, uh, automatic deployments, regression testing, and all those things. So I just, um, I can't get into too much on this slide because there's a whole lot there. I will just tease it and say that if you adopt uh, Databricks or really any configura uh, configuration as code strategy with these frameworks, you will be able to do what you see here. So with that, I'm gonna jump into a demo. I think my time is gonna, is gonna work really well here. Uh, I wanna just do a quick check with Mike Jellin to make sure that, hey Mike, you see, the, you see my interactive notebook, right? Yep, absolutely. Fantastic. Okay, so I'm attached to a cluster here. I don't know, um, probably there's a lot of you uh, watching this webinar familiar with interactive notebooks. I'll just give you a quick sort of two minute introduction to what they are. You're looking at it. Uh, so um, notebooks are sort of evolved in the data science um, discipline. And there's a reason why that science uh, term is in data science. And that's because a lot of the folks that sort of evolved that discipline were in some way scientists. And what they expected was a way to test their theories uh, of, of data uh, transformations and, and data patterns. Um, write that, write those data transformation processes, but also document it in such a way that another data scientist would be able to, to walk through and follow it. So what I'm proposing here is that, and this is what a lot of people do with Databricks, they're not just doing machine learning and data science, they're doing traditional ETL use cases. And that is because it's a great way to collaborate with fellow developers. Um, if you have some process that you've written end to end, I often hear this, why code is not great for uh, documentation and, and, and collaboration. Well, maybe, and I think that's debatable, 
but at least inside of a notebook it is because I can share this notebook with another developer and he or she would be able to walk through this, especially if I've documented it well, execute these things, see the results and follow along and be able to say, yeah, this is exactly the way our data should be trans transformed. And then once this notebook is complete, I can just schedule the notebook to run it. Um, I, I can do note notebooks with a little bit more wrapping uh, required to do pure streaming use cases, but at least from a batch use case, I can just send this notebook to the Databricks API and say, run it uh, at, at this schedule or wherever these events occur and it will execute. And so I think um, when we think about old school coding to do data warehouse loads, we think about a whole bunch of Perl scripts or whatever where the logic is buried in such a way that we really can't make much sense of it. I think when you, when you bring the interactive notebook uh, in, in play, that sort of goes away. There is, a, um, there is an easy way for me to write a, a data load process in such a way that it can be followed by another developer. So here's a little bit of the overview. We got some source data. Most of it's coming from CSV files. So if you were to buy into this strategy, you need a way to get your data from your source systems into an object store of some kind. There's a lot of solutions for that. Stream sets, which I mentioned, which I mentioned earlier, is a great way to do it, but there's tons and tons of ways to get your data into object store. And I can even write that in Spark if I wanted to write it in another process. So, uh, but for what you're gonna see in this demo, the data, the CSV files have, all, have already been unloaded and put into the object store. And in most cases, they're CSV. You're gonna see me at layer in some JSON data in a minute, but in general, uh, a bunch of CSV files. So this is a, a theoretical or fictional trading company, brokerage company. Um, and so we have a bunch of files that, that represent from those um, legacy systems. So you can see me, I've uploaded a file. Here it is, the brokerage trade file. It's sitting in a location. I'm just gonna create a Spark data frame uh, to read that into memory, into Spark. And then you see this display, I'll just execute it here. It may take a minute for this cluster to warm up. So give me just, you know, bear with me. There we go. Um, so uh, I've, I'm, you know, reading those files, pulling into what's called a data frame. And you'll also see me, I'm going to mix in some Scala, Python, and SQL. And the reason I'm doing that is I just want you to see that you can, all inside the same notebook, I can code in a lot of different ways. I can support multiple developers and the, and the skills that they uh, that he, that those developers are, are comfortable in. Um, and so the, the, the idea that I have to adopt Python Scala and, or SQL um, in exclusion is not just simply not the case. So this is me reading in that data frame. And then you'll also see that I just did a quick display of the data frame. So I don't need to jump outside of this development experience to query my data. I can do it right here in the notebook. I can run this, I can make changes, run this over and over again if I were so inclined and continually I can iterate right here inside this framework. And so the other thing to bear in mind is that, you know, I can use the interactive notebook as a way to test my data and see that my granularity, the kind of things we would step out to a SQL editor for and do right here. But also when it comes time to schedule this, those selects and displays and, and uh, uh, steps in the process, even though there's no user that's consuming that, they still run. So this is a lightweight way for you to write unit tests inside your code. This process would fail if that, well, really it's more about the SQL, but any piece in this, if I display it right after or do a visualization on top of it, that would cause the process to fail if for some reason that visualization was charting to columns that weren't there or if that transformation process didn't work. So there is a way for you to embed unit tests and they're the same unit tests that you run yourself while you're iterating on your code. So here it is, I'm pulling in a data frame and I wanna take a look at the data frame while, right while I'm doing it and there it is. So now I'm gonna write this data frame, it's loaded in memory, I wanna write it to Delta. So that is just remember, that's a file format that makes, in this case, I'm in Amazon, 
S3 look and act more like a relational database that, that we all know and love. So I'll run that cell. That's gonna, um, that's gonna write the Delta file into a format that the Databricks can, um, can use. So that you see that running. Now that's all good. Now from there we can start using SQL. So this is me creating a Delta table and from here on out, it's pretty much SQL until we load Snowflake um, of me creating this trade table. So we'll do that. And this is sort of just building the, the, the it's, sort of, it's sort of like the DDL, right? It's, it's kind of like an external table. I've defined a structure on top of the file format I loaded. So there you go. Yep, that all looks great. And now that we're, uh, oh, oh, one more thing. There is a way for me not to have to do this step uh, where I write the data using a data frame or using, in this case, Python. I can do it all in Delta. It's got one uh, small drawback, which is when I do this, um, you see the column names. I, I haven't figured out a way to, to, to get around that. So when you, see, when you visualize it, there's no way in this Delta everything statement for me to rename the columns. So bear with me a second while this finishes. Time's looking pretty good. You can see that, and there may be a way to do this, but trust me, I, I tried. Um, so if you wanted to do this Delta, you know, SQL, com complete SQL approach, you would just have to take another step. And that is to create a table where you clearly, um, you know, um, uh, give column names for the, for that table and that would work. So I just wanted to show you the, the pure SQL or the Delta only way where I don't even have to instantiate a data frame. It does it for me underneath the covers. So that would work. I'm processing the same three data sets and there's several million rows in this data set. So if you're wondering why it's not instantaneous, that's because there's, there's a lot of data in there. That didn't, I think I got a lot of null values. Not sure why that is, we'll move on. But this is what I am, this is what I'm using. That's a, a sample. This, this is the table I'm actually using downstream everywhere else. All right, so it's a normalized model. So we have a bunch of other CSV files that I need to, to load. We'll just kick these off. I need to build some other tables so that I can join and get a complete view of a trade. So these are things like status of the trade that's sit in a normalized table, uh, the brokerage status type, um, the trade type, you know, is it a, is it market? Is it buy? Is it limit? Um, those sorts of things. So I wrote and created all those Delta tables as you can see. And then I also have some JSON data. So I'm going to imagine our HR system is not legacy and it's got uh, ability for me to get JSON data out. I'm going to do this in batch, but it's not too big of a step to take to do this streaming where you could uh, pull the JSON data out. And there we go. All looks good. And so there's my um, HR data. And what I really need here is just the, the brokers. Right. So the only HR, the only data I don't really have from my legacy trading system is information about the brokers themselves. I need to get that from our HR system. Makes sense. And now I'm going to create Delta tables of all of these, um, all of these CSV files. So create table um, using that Delta location that I loaded using data frames and all good. So another thing, um, you know, a big fan of the inline table view of your data where you can just do a display or a select. I am able to right here inside of this notebook actually start visualizing my data. So I want you to think about this use case in that you can actually prototype some of the visualizations that you want to eventually deliver in your analytics tool. So I'm not saying that you necessarily embed these from your notebook, but what I am saying is that at least as people are 
typically there's a big disconnect between the ETL and the data visualization, usually different teams, the ETL's happening, and then the visualizations aren't considered until you know, days, weeks, months later. Um, in this case, we can test without leaving this environment whether or not the, the, the types of visualizations that we need to support can be done with the data as we're delivering it. So think of this as a prototype of the dashboards that you probably have requirements for. Do it right here inside of your data engineering uh, code. So let's just, I can't remember if I ran that just now. Let's run it again, just to be sure. You can see the residue from my prior run that I did right before I started. So usually I clear that. Um, apologies for not doing that. And so I like to bread, breadcrumbs is what I call this, where we just, you know, throughout your process, you drop a lot of select statements for two reasons. One is that your uh, collaborators can, can follow along, run the statement, see the data, get a feel for it. But also these are our unit tests, remember. So I can unit test all throughout my process um, and see, and, and so when it comes time to execute. Now I'm gonna create a, a data lake version of our fact table. So that may be a, seem like a contradiction in terms, but bear with me. So a data lake is a place for you to store raw data, eventually that we wanna load into a data warehouse. There's a couple ways you could do that. You could feed the raw data into your data warehouse and then process it there. But I'm trying to adopt a strategy where all of our data processing and data transformation logic lives in one layer or one format, one framework, I should say. And so all we're doing here is we're actually in our data lake, we're building our data warehouse tables and then just loading them into our data warehouse. Your, strat, you know, your mileage may vary, whatever works for you, but that's the approach I'm taking here. So I built this fact table. So this is my, this is my trade fact. And there it is. You can see um, um, what my fact table looks like. And I can, you know, do some aggregation on it. I can test some of the ways I'm going to query it right here using breadcrumbs. See that my data um, profile that I'm doing makes sense. And then the final step really is just to load Snowflake. And so this you can see is, um, by the way, you can see the first place I ever ran this set, uh, presentation was at a conference called K-Scope, for those of you that don't come from the Oracle world. But in general, another um, argument people have is that when you write code, your, your credentials are right there in your code for everybody to see. It's just not the case. We have so many ways to store secrets for these frameworks. Databricks has one built in. You could use something like, uh, HashiCorp or whatever is popular in your, in, uh, or Amazon key, key store, uh, secret storage, Google key storage, whatever you want to use if you want to use a, a complete uh, cross organization option. But if you just want to store some secrets, Databricks can store those for you. And then you just call, make this little call to get the secret out. Um, I'm creating a data frame to be able to load into Snowflake. And you can see then once I can just take that data frame with my format as Snowflake, have some Snowflake specific options for that data frame for the, the connector, the Spark connector that, that Snowflake has, and then a few more options for me to delete some columns, not use some columns, and also I'm going to append, not merge or transform or any of that. I'm just going to append this data and run the cell. So this is taking that Delta Lake table, writing it to Snowflake. The Snowflake connector for Spark, which is what's being used here, is just incredible. So if what you want to do is cache um, your data movements uh, jobs into Snowflake, then this is a great connector. And then we will just, hopefully I want to get to questions. So that happened. And now just to show I can create a data frame from Snowflake to read that data back out. So that's really it. Uh, Mike, I'd like to open it up if there were any questions throughout the process that I might can answer. Yes, absolutely. It's definitely been uh, a lot of good questions, some, uh, some comments, lots of people. Uh, thank you for the info and knowledge that you've been sharing here. But one of the, the first questions, and, and this question came in a couple times in several different uh, forms, but Kent was the first one to ask it. So I'll just 
tie his name to it. The data um, warrior. Yes. Can you get the same metadata for lineage with SQL as you get with one of the visual tools that you have a, repos a repository? This is important for compliance with regulations like GDPR and CCPA. Yeah, absolutely. So um, if you hook your engine, right, or hook your train to um, some of these open source frameworks like Databricks, now Databricks, for instance, doesn't, doesn't have a, a, a pre-built solution, but because it uses Spark and a lot of open source technologies underneath the covers, there are a lot of these uh, metadata, lineage, governance, projects out either there's proprietary solutions that can connect to a lot of the no uh, usual suspects such as spark uh, frameworks um, uh, there's open source options and there's uh, proprietary options most of the clouds now the three big clouds um, and I'll actually I'll throw Oracle in there the four clouds they all have um, some sort of data cataloging tool so I would say that one of the th it's it, there's a pro and a con here Kent which is um, you know, from leg legacy software teams tend to want a solution that they can buy for a whole lot of money that does that solves all their requirements end to end. I don't think that has ever worked, by the way. I've never seen it really very super successful. Uh, I tend to, uh, to prefer cobbling together, and I, that sounds like a bad word, but uh, cobbling together some of these open source frameworks so that I can deliver exactly the style of governance that I need to, to deliver. So I'll tease it just a bit to say there's a whole bunch of frameworks out there that connect that can connect to things like Databricks that can connect to Snowflake metadata. Um, AdminSyn is, is one that you might look at if you're interested in both of those. Uh, but that there's great frameworks. I mean, you saw DBT, if you're just doing SQL uh, outside of a notebook, you just want to write SQL scripts, um, and I'll be talking about that in a future webinar. It has great lineage. So I think that we're, I think we're in a better place lineage wise than we've ever been uh, because we have a lot more options um, and a lot of connectors uh, to these different frameworks. All right. Thank you. I know we're getting to the top of the hour and, and some folks have to, to drop off. I mean, we are recording this and we'll send it out. Uh, so if you have to drop off here, it, it's okay. You'll, you'll get the, the replay in the next day or so. And, then you can just fast forward to, to the end. Um, another question from, from Sanjay is, should we look into data replication tools that are different than data transformation tools? Great question. And the answer is absolutely yes. So we used to look in old, uh, well, we'll say just legacy, right? Or traditional, I'll say to not sound negative. Traditional ETL tools, we wanted a tool that did all of it, right? Brought it from the source, loaded it to the target. Perhaps we were doing ELT or ETL, but the tool handled that for us and we didn't have to worry about it. And that is just not the world that, that, we're, that we're in today. And the reason is because a single ETL tool used to be able to do that because all of your sources were relational. I mean, outside of a few small examples where maybe you had a file or maybe you had uh, you know, something else, but 95% of what we were pulling from and writing to were relational sources. So an ETL tool that was very relational in the way it thought was a good solution for that. It's just simply not the case. So anyone who's ever tried to use a traditional ETL tool to pull from uh, some sort of SaaS application for all the way from Salesforce, Workday, ServiceNow, uh, Google, all the Google APIs, you know that's a fool's errand. Traditional ETL tools don't do a good job there. So what we recommend is things like Fivetran, which is a built-in connector for freaking everything on the inter in the internet, right? But all your on-prem systems, all the cloud services you have, stream sets can fill this gap too. If you have something that Fivetran doesn't support or you just want to um, standardize on stream sets, it's got the ability to call out any REST API, Twitter, Salesforce, whatever you want to pull from. So absolutely, yes. Uh, best tool for the right tool, right job. Uh, select a tool that does data replication that brings all of your data into your data lake or your data warehouse. Then use SQL or something that allows you to express SQL-like patterns easily and hopefully in a Git repository using CICD and regression testing. Do your transformations in SQL. Absolutely.
All right, thank you. Uh, one other question here from Jean-Pierre. In regards to the notebook that you were showing a little bit earlier, where did you get your metadata? Now, how did you, how did the data developers know which sources to pick up? First off, hey JP, long time. Um, so in this scenario, uh, uh, not sure if you got on late or if you're there for the whole time, but I dumped a bunch of CSV files um, into, in this case, S3 bucket, right? So you can see that I said infer schema here, right? So that's where my metadata came from. Um, I used um, in, you know, the sort of the quick, uh, quick start option here to say infer schema from a CSV file. I did the same thing with the JSON file. So, uh, you know, if things are easy, right, you got CSV files that you've dumped into cloud storage or, uh, or JSON files or Parquet or whatever, something that has metadata inside of it, then it's going to be pretty easy for Databricks to consume that. So if we think about like the, the gentleman's last question of how to get data ingested, uh, most of these solutions, I'll say all of them, um, have the option for me to deliver that data from the source system in a format that does respect schema. So great question. Definitely choose a file format. CSV is not great, um, as, you, as I know you know, uh, because you don't have the schema per record. So probably it's, a, it, it's not a great, uh, but I wanted to build a scenario where we had a legacy system that, could, that we could only get CSV out of. But then we also showed, you know, a more modern system where we could get JSON out of it. So absolutely ingest the data into your data lake in a file format that respects schema. Uh, and then there's also frameworks, you, you know, the schema registry that's part of Kafka. And there's a lot of other solutions that will allow you to store version your schema over time and make it available via uh, API calls. So quick and dirty schema in, in, inference that I did here but there probably is a bigger talk around what's the best way to own metadata uh, and schema across your organization. All right, thank you. And one final question here, just to close things off, we're almost five after. Um, and so the last question, at least for today's webinar here is from Cindy. Uh, she is saying that her company is roughly 10 years behind the times when it comes to adopting technology. What are ideas to help change the culture to move towards the modern tools and thought processes that you've laid out here? So this is a, this is a, a really good question and, a, and I wish I had the um, silver bullet answer. What I'll say is that I think that it takes, um, and we do a lot of this as a company, uh, speaking to um, customers that have been 10 years behind, we still talk to a lot of those by the way, and try to, we just, we need to do sessions like this where you explain the benefit of modern tools. Right, so you can talk about configuration as code as an option, having all of your stuff sitting in Git repo, so you can do GitOps style approaches. I think regression testing and unit testing, something that traditional ETL tools and frankly analytics tools have never thought about or considered, um, or is a great introductory, sort of a great Trojan horse for you to try to get to a modern platform is to say, we should be testing. How are we testing? How are we doing automated testing? We need to be able to have proper data governments. And if the, our legacy tools don't do a great job there, then we need to adopt a platform where we can use some of these modern op open source and or proprietary options for that. So I think that if you just move down, you know, uh, this presentation will be available uh, online. It already is. Um, but we'll make sure that we tweet out the link. Um, if you go through all of these pros and cons of code versus clicks, you can probably find a few of those to really latch onto that would move the meter for your organization. Maybe it's testing, maybe it's speed, maybe it's ease of use, maybe it's collaboration. Maybe it's some of these things that code brings us, um, you know, introduce all of them, but there's usually one or two of those things that organizations are really struggling with. And I would say that uh, find out what those are and just, you, you know, that's your Trojan horse to get the discussion going for you to migrate away uh, from some of these legacy tools. One more thing I'll say, absolutely without doubt, cost. Everything I showed you is dirt 
cheap, right? Databricks and Snowflake, um, obviously they can get expensive if you're moving massive amounts of data, but they truly are egalitarian in their pricing, pay per use, right? So most of these tools are so much cheaper than what you're using, better support, um, you know, uh, a real roadmap for, for uh, new features and, and new functionality. So you can always just go in with that, with that tired old chestnut of cost. Um, and if that can't, if, if cost can't move the meter, then uh, you probably are lost. <laughs> nice. All right. Well, thank you very much, Stuart. Thank you, everybody, for attending today. Uh, if we appreciate you taking time out of your everyone's busy schedule. Thank you to, to Stuart for, for leading us uh, in the, the last hour or so here. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we will send this out to everyone as a replay uh, in the coming days here. And also keep a lookout for other uh, webinars that we will be doing uh, as we uh, take to online versus doing a roadshow and, and visiting in person for the time being here. So thank you again, everyone. Have yourselves a great day. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.